When working with dynamics, we often find ourselves in a situation where we'd like to constrain the movement of our objects. And while this can be done manually, it quickly becomes tedious when you have lots of objects. The tool of choice here is a constraint network, and today we're going to build one for bullet dynamics. So what we want to do is have a look at our template point. That is the point where we'd like to pin the pack primitive to, and that's also the point that we're going to use to generate our pack prims using the copy to point sub. And we want to allow the primitive to rotate around that point, but not to move. That means rotational motion is okay, translational motion is a no-go. And to restrict the movement of our primitive, we're going to create a constraint. And in this case, a constraint is a tiny line, a polyline, connecting the template point of our pack primitive to the point where it should be pinned to. In this case, it's our template point, and this is the point we'd like to pin our primitive to. In our case, we'd like to pin our primitive directly to its template point, so we'll have to move the second point of our constraint to exactly the same position as our template point. So we'll end up with a line that has a length of zero, but it still is a line that means two points that are connected. And finally, what we have to do is on that line, we store some attributes to configure how to constrain our primitive. On the one hand, on the constraints new point, the one that we just created in order to have a second point for the line, we store an individual name that we're going to use to assign this constraint to its respective primitive. Then on the constraints line, on the polyline itself, we store an attribute called constraint underscore name, and this tells Dobbs which constraint type the constraint is. In our case, it's a pin constraint. And then we can also store an optional attribute on that line, which is called constraint underscore type. And this tells stops what to constrain, the rotation or the position. And this by default is set to position, so we can omit it in our case. Let's build this in Houdini by starting out with a grid, diving in and resizing it to be one by one. Let's have it have 70 rows and 60 columns like so. And also let's create a box that we're going to use as a geometry to copy on those points. Let's set its size to be 3 by 0 0.5 by say 8. And also scale it down quite a bit to say 0 0.005 so that we have a small box that we can now copy on our grid. First let's add some normals to our box and then use the copy to points to copy this box onto our grid points like so. Let's append a null, call this one out, underscore, pack underscore prints. Now let's also create the constraint network by using the points from our grid, by first dropping down an add to isolate only the points from our grid, by checking delete geometry but keep the points, and then appending a point wrangle. And in the point wrangle, let's create those tiny primitives that we'll use as constraints by first creating a second point for each individual primitive, which should be exactly on the same point as our grid points. Let's use an integer, call it new PT for new point. And let's call the add point function to create a new point at our current points position. So in our middle mouse on this, I have now 8,400 points where before I had 4,200, so that worked. Also, let's create a new primitive, which will be the actual constraint. Let's use the add prim function, and we want to add a polyline that is just an open line. And let's use our current point and the newly created point as the vertices of these lines. Now the points have disappeared, but when I check display primitive numbers, I can see I created a whole bunch of new primitives here. Now let's create those two attributes that I need. The name on my newly created point and the constraint name on the newly created primitive. So let's first create a new string, call it con name for constraint name, and it should be equal to, let's call it stick underscore, and I want to make sure that this is an individual name for each newly created primitive. So what I'm going to do is I will add to this string the current points number just to enumerate those primitives. I'm going to do that by adding a string, and I'll first have to convert my current point number to a string, which is done by the command i2a, like so. Let's highlight this, go to the geo spreadsheet, and nothing happened yet because I haven't written it out to our points. So let's use the set point attrib to write this con name onto our newly created points. Let's call the attribute name. And when we scroll down in the geo spreadsheet, we can see for our newly created points, we gave them a name called stick underscore point number. Next on our newly created primitives, let's set their attribute constraint name. 
to pin with a capital P, like so. Let's check. Yeah, that's written onto our newly created primitives. Okay, let's append a null here as well. Call this one out underscore constraints. Wire this up. Now let's finally drop down our dot net. Wire in our pack params in the first and our constraints into the second slot and dive into that dot net. And what I need first inside of the dot net is an object to store the simulation data on. In our case, that's going to be an RBD packed object like this. Let's drag this down here. And what I want to do under the bullet data tab is, as I know I have only boxes here, I can set my geometry representation to a box like so, and then auto fit it. That's a bit quicker than the convex hull. So I have my simulation object here. Next, I want to create the constraint network with the constraint network node. So wire in my RBD packed object in the first slot. And I'll also need a hard constraint relationship to set up my constraint network. Let's wire this in the second slot here. And in the hard constraint relationship, let's scroll down and the data name should be set to pin with a capital P, like so. And also on the constraint network, let's set the geometry source not to SOP, but to the second context geometry. Let's just check in the hard constraint relationship. I want to set my rest length to be zero so that my objects don't get pushed apart as soon as I start simulation. Okay, finally, I'll add a rigid body solver, wire this up down here, and wire this directly to our output. And we can't see anything happening yet. That is because in my RBD packed object, I'll have to specify where my geometry comes from, and I want to set it to the first context geometry, and now I can see all those dynamic objects. Okay, let's head up one level and highlight our dot net and hit sim. And there is not much happening yet. Because on the one hand, there is no forces acting on our objects here. And on the other hand, I also need to assign our individual constraints to our individual objects here. So let's create both a force and this assignment by using another point wrangle, which will wire in right before the copy to points. And what I want to do on those points coming in here, I want to set the exact same attribute as here. So let's copy those two lines here. paste them here. And I don't want to set the point attribute of another point, but my current point attribute called name. So we can do that with a shorthand string at name equals con name. So what I did now, I created a relationship between the second point of my constraints that I created here and the template points that should be constrained by these constraints. And also let's set up some initial force to actually move those objects here. And what I want to use is an angular velocity, an initial rotation, so to speak of. And I'm going to create that by creating a vector called W, which is Houdini's internal attribute for angular velocity. And I'm going to just set it up to be some random number. And let's scale it up a bit and multiply it by four, like so. Okay, I now created my name here and my W. Let's check that in the geo spreadsheet. Got a name here and my W vector. Perfect. Okay, save this again and re-simulate this. Still not much happening, so let's check what went wrong here. And there are two things that I have to make sure. On the one hand, on the RBD packed object under initial state, Let's check inherit velocity from point velocity that makes sure that for my initial geometry, my angular velocity gets copied over onto those dynamic objects. And yeah, of course, to be able to simulate pack primitives, it would be nice to actually generate pack primitives. So let's check pack and instance in the copy to points up to create pack primitives that we can then finally in the dotnet use to simulate our dynamics. So let's hit play and keep our fingers crossed. So you can now see we have those copies rotating without actually intersecting themselves because they are now colliding and they are also staying in place and not moving across the space. Okay, however, that seems a bit random and that is because we set those pack prims up with a random initial angular velocity. So instead, let's create something a bit more art directable or art directed and let's drag up our grid all the way up here because we're gonna use an attrib from map in the image settings, let's check invert V and select texture. For example, this portrait of Gauss here. Let's set our export attribute to float so we get a grayscale image and then append a polyframe, which we're going to set up to generate an attribute gradient from our color value CD. We don't need the normal, the attribute gradient is stored in the tangent here. So let's call that W because we're going to use it as an angular velocity. And then when we middle mouse on this, we can see it's stored as a vertex here. So let's promote this with an 
attribute promote here, wire this in between the polyframe and the point wrangle, and we want to promote W from vertex to point, middle mouse on this, it's now point value. And what I have to do in my point wrangle here is actually delete or comment out where we set the random W value. Okay, let's highlight the dot net again. Oh, and when I look at this, I can see I get the color value transferred as well on my point. So let's just set our color here in the point wrangle to say white, like so, and simulate this. And you can see some of those outlines that came from the original image appearing there in the rotational direction of our pack primitives. However, what you can also see is that the rotation kind of slows down because it's only applied on our initial frame. So what if we want to have a constant angular velocity acting on those primitives? So let's stop the simulation here and go back into our dot net and on the RBD packed object under initial state, let's uncheck inherit velocity from point velocity. And instead what we want, we can use this input here, the post solve to actually set attributes on our pack prims after each simulation step. And for that, we're going to use a geo wrangle here, which under the inputs tab, we will set up to have the first context as input one and the second context as input two. So we can access our data coming in through our dot net slots as we are used to in the standard point wrangle or primitive wrangle. So under code, what I want to do for each simulation step, I want to set my primitives W value to the W value of my points coming in through my first input slot. Just like so. Let's head up one level and hit play again. So now we have this constant velocity pushing on our pack primitives, which tends to stronger enforce the rotation of those individual primitives. However, it can lead to jittering sometimes because even although my primitives have settled in a position where they cannot move, where they collide with primitives around them, still we have this angular velocity pushing on them. So sometimes they can jitter when using that technique. And that is how you set up constraint networks when using pack primitives. As always, a huge thank you goes out to all our patrons. And it's amazing to feel the enthusiasm that you guys have for the stuff we do. So our very special thank you goes to Mohamed Al Abri, Michael Ivanov, Rob Bryant, Refik Anadol, Chris Ebert, Nick Nick, John Koontz, and Joseph Howard. Thank you guys. Wait, 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 wait. I'll have to add a small epilogue here. So after I finished the setup and started rendering out an artwork for this tutorial, I realized that generating your initial angular velocity by taking the gradient of your image wouldn't really give the results that I was expecting. What worked way better for me and what is way simpler is just taking the image's color as your initial W, that is angular velocity attribute, which results in this kind of motion here. So that's what I used for this tutorial's artwork. So I guess sometimes the easier solution is also the nicer solution.